27 if you want to turn there and certainly a very uh, somber very sobering uh, passage of scripture as we get to the torture uh, and the continued trial of uh, of Jesus here this time before uh, Pilate and um, just uh, keep in mind the fact that there were six trials uh, three Jewish three Gentile uh, Matthew's gospel really focuses on the third that we went through last week of the Jewish trials, all illegal. Uh, the one in the home of Caiaphas where he was tortured. Uh, we mentioned the fact that that torture chamber is still there, can be seen today, the same one that Peter, James, and John will later be tortured in the, themselves. Uh, they then, as we get to our text, release him, or not release him, but uh, send him off to uh, be uh, to Pilate because they need at that point, they need Pilate to be the one to condemn him because he's the one that can uh, institute uh, capital punishment. Uh, the Jews had lost that ability under the uh, previous um, procurator, uh, 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 a guy named Caponius. I'm not sure if his first name was Al or not, but uh, <laughs> that's how I remember his name. And, uh, and that is significant because um, according to a passage in Genesis, the Messiah had to come before they lost the ability to actually uh, commit, follow through with capital punishment. So when they lost that ability, rabbis wept in the streets and rent their garments because they felt like they had missed the Messiah. He was there, though. He was a 12-year-old kid, and that's why that passage is in the Bible, to know that Jesus was there. He was in Jerusalem, and he was proclaiming through his wisdom, even as a, a young child, that the Messiah had come, and, and the word of God was, was true. Rome, Rome now again has, has Pilate um, there ruling and there'll be three Gentile trials. Pilate sends them to Herod, comes back to Pilate uh, and, uh, and again we'll see that the focus here is simply in Matthew's gospel on his appearing before Pilate. Verse uh, 1 of chapter 27, early in the morning all the chief priests and the elders of the people came to the decision to put Jesus to death. They bound him, led him away and handed him over to Pilate the governor when Judas, who had been betrayed, saw that Jesus was condemned, he, seized, he was seized with remorse and, and returned the 30 silver coins to the chief priest uh, and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied? That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. The chief priest picked up the coins and said, it is against the law to put this into the treasury since it's blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why it has been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the 30 silver coins, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even a single charge to the great amazement of the governor. Now, it was the governor's custom at the feast to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. When the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? For he knew it was out of envy that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas to have Je and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? Asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called Christ? Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, 
He took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, let his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. And the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, king of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put on his own clothes. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. Let's pray. Lord, we do just uh, come to you and difficult to even read. We can read it, but as we begin to, Lord, uh, allow the, the meaning of the words to settle upon our minds, it's, it becomes a bit sobering and staggering to consider what it is that you endured. We can study about it, and Lord, we can, we can read about it, but we pray that uh, this morning, a familiar passage, familiar story, we're all aware of what Jesus did, what he went through, but Lord, we pray that uh, it would have a, an impact upon our lives this morning, that by your Spirit, you would speak to our hearts and, and help, us, help us understand what this text really means, what it really says. Lord, what it should mean to, to us as, as followers of, of Jesus Christ. Lord, so again, we just commit our time and our time in the Word to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. There's, uh, again, just uh, a little background that we've, we've mentioned already, but um, I've, uh, I've been to this place mentioned in verse 27, the uh, where the uh, the Praetorium, where they gathered, uh, Herod built uh, the uh, a fortress there for his friend Mark Anthony. Therefore, the An Antonio Fortress, uh, still there today in Jerusalem. Uh, again, if you think of the the temple proper and the whole thing and the walls around it, on one corner of it, built up above, was the Antonio Fortress, so the Romans could look down to kind of keep an eye on things that are in the temple. Remember the Book of Acts, Paul's down <laughs> down there. And uh, he's trying to, to preach to, uh, to the Jews there uh, once again, which was his heart's desire. And uh, he said that bad word, Gentile, and, and then there's a, a big mob rushing against him. Well, the Romans are able to get down and intervene because they're watching all the time, and especially during the, uh, the feast times because they're concerned about riots and uproars, and they were there to, quote, uh, again, keep things uh, under control. Uh, in that place, even today, you can go from... 21st century and go down some stairs and so forth to get down to a lower level to the first century level the actual pavements the actual place where Jesus stood and this happened to him it's not speculation that's where he was carved into those stone pavements are the configuration of the games that the sh soldiers would play with a rolling kind of a dice and gambling and so forth that's where they hung out that's where the event took place and and it's, uh, it's uh, uh, again, it's one of those places where you're there and you're reading the scriptures. Uh, there's not a lot of talking going on. You're just, you're just kind of taking it all in. I, I, I mention that again to remind us that this is history. This really happened. Jesus really went through this. There's, there's all the evidence in the world and the places you can go and see. Uh, for a long time, the, the critics, the higher critics of, uh, of Christianity like, like to point out to the fact that nowhere in antiquity in any document or anything else has ever mentioned a man named Pontius Pilate who was the procurator or the governor of Judea during this time period. They love to be able to point to that, but that's okay. <laughs> Sooner or later, the archaeologists keep digging. And now in Caesarea Philippi, there's a stone that you can see there, and there's the name, Pontius Pilate where he ruled and the date that he ruled and, and so forth. It's, it's all there for us. Actual events. This is really what God did on our behalf. Let's look first at, uh, at Judas in verse 3 to 10. Judas returns the money in fulfillment of prophecy. A couple of things uh, uh, about him. The first is that his repentance was insufficient. Notice verse 3. He was filled with remorse. Verse 4. I have sinned. 
But that term remorse means he was sorry for what he did in terms of the outcome. I'm sorry I did this. Look how it worked out. It didn't work out the way that he thought it would. The idea does not carry the idea of his changing his behavior. And uh, again, the, the uh, verse that the Apostle Paul gives us from Corinthians that, uh, that uh, uh, worldly sorrow brings uh, repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. Uh, and that's what it does here. He was sorry for what he did. It didn't work out. You may have experienced that with your, your, your kids before. You know, you catch them doing something they weren't supposed to be doing. Oh, sorry, daddy. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> They're really sorry because they know what's coming next as far as the punishment. But it's not like I've had a change of mind. I've thought this through and I see that that's wrong and I'm never going to be doing that again. Uh, which is what real repentance is. It's a change of mind, which uh, again works itself out in terms of a change of behavior. Let me read you a little passage from Hebrews 12 about Esau, a uh, character in the Old Testament that uh, did a little crying over what he had done, but certainly uh, there was no re true repentance. Uh, Hebrews 12, 15, and just kind of excuse me, between the retreat and everything else, there's no way I could pull off getting all the PowerPoint slides for you. So uh, I did get some notes done, so you've got the references if you want to uh, uh, see those uh, later. But here, Hebrews 12, 15, see it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or godless like Esau. Uh, is Esau godless? He's godless. Who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, which is, again was what repentance is, though he sought the blessing with tears. He cries over it. He's sorry about the way it turned out, but there's real no repentance, and he is considered godless. He's an example of a, a, a type of of Judas, whose repentance was not genuine. Secondly, his realization did not cause him to seek forgiveness. Uh, Deuteronomy 27, 25 says, Cursed is the man who accepts a bribe to kill an innocent person. That's what they all did, by the way. But uh, that's what Judas did here in particular. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, he, he's under a curse and he never seeks forgiveness uh, thirdly, the results of his committing suicide indicates that he had an unbelieving heart. Uh, Jesus says this about Jesus, uh, Judas earlier in John 6, 70. He says, have I not chosen you, the 12, yet one of you is a devil? That's not meant to be a complimentary term, by the way. Uh, he met Judas, the, Simon of, uh, uh, the son of Simon Iscariot, who, though one of the 12, was later to betray him. Uh, his suicide was an indication that he had an unbelieving heart. Does that mean that everybody that commits suicide has an unbelieving heart? No, absolutely not. And we've talked about that in, in some detail as we've kind of experienced the repercussions of that here in our own fellowship not long ago. But at the same time, for Judas it is. It's an indication that he had an unbelieving heart. No, no repentance, no seeking forgiveness. And then there's the response of the hypocritical leaders <laughs> and boy, are they hypocritical. What do they want to do with the money? Well, you know, we can't put it in the treasury. You know, it's blood money. Yeah, who gave it to them? You did. <laughs> but uh, very hypocritical. Uh, and so therefore what they do is they use it to buy uh, the potter's field, which would be purchased for a burial ground for the, the foreigners. Notice what is called later, a field of blood. Why? Because... It, it, it was paid for the life of an innocent man. Isn't that interesting? Where's that field? Oh, that's the field of blood. You know, that's Judas, that guy. Innocent Jesus died because of him. Very interesting that it becomes known as that. And of course, that's in fulfillment of the, the prophet Zechariah. Needs a little explanation here. Your Bible says, what does it say? Who, what prophet said that? Jeremiah. How come? Oh, uh, again, Simple Jewish uh, idiom. Uh, uh, in, the, in the Bible, you've got uh, a Jewish Bible. You've got three sections uh, of Scripture. You have the Torah, the writings of, uh, of Moses, the first five books. And then you have the writings, beginning with the book of Psalms. And then you have the prophets, beginning with the book of, in a Hebrew Bible, Jeremiah. 
three different books. If you're going to refer to a proverb, you might say, in the Psalms it says, and then you give the proverb, because you always name the first book in the section. So therefore, when Matthew, again, a Jewish writer, writing to a Jewish audience, uses a Jewish idiom that says, he doesn't say in the prophets, he says in Jeremiah. And it's a reference to all of the prophets, but actually it's Zechariah that actually says it. So it's just, it's just a reference to where it's found in their Bible in that third section. Uh, it's not really a contradiction, but again, it is a fulfillment of a, a prophecy of, of Zechariah 11, 12, and 13. Uh, secondly, Pilate reviews the evidence against, against Jesus. Matthew kind of introduces this thing with Judas and then almost abruptly takes us uh, into the courtroom here with Pontius Pilate. The first we know that Pilate uh, reviewed the evidence based on his own position uh, at the trial at this time. Uh, and it, it is interesting, uh, I've uh, mentioned this a few times and uh, sometimes people ask me for the documentation. I really get a lot of this just to tell you from uh, an early book I read of Chuck Colson where he documents it uh, very well. But it helps us understand what's going on historically uh, at, at the time of uh, Pontius Pilate ruling. Uh, by the way, Pontius Pilate begins his career as a slave. And then he's able to work his way out of that and through political connections ends up rising to power. It's those political connections that kind of need to be understood. He takes power there in about 26 uh, AD. He rules for 10 years until 36 AD. Uh, and, um, and he has a friend, uh, not to kind of belabor this, give you the, the Reader's Digest version here. He's got a friend named Sir Jonas. Uh, they are both part of what's called a, a, a select group of individuals called Friends of Caesar. Uh, and, they're, and these guys are on the rise uh, uh, politically. You know, you hear the, watch the news at night, oh, he's a rising young star in the Republican Party, or he's a rising young, so they were rising young stars, you know, in terms of being Friends of Caesar. But sir, so Pontius Pilate is part of this group, and out of that, he ends up becoming the governor of Judea. Not the best place to be st stationed if you're in the military, but at least he's the head guy. He's on his way up. He's down there. While he's gone, then his good buddy, Sir Jonas, uh, gets uh, higher aspirations than being a friend of Caesar. In fact, he wants to take over. He thinks he's got enough of the key guys in the military. He's got enough key senators behind him. And so when the Caesar is out of town, he, uh, he basically has a coup. He seeks to take over Rome. Caesar hears about it. He's got more troops. And he goes back and quashes the rebellion, kills every one of them, including Serjanus. Oh, but there's somebody missing that wasn't killed in the friends of Caesar. Pilate. So what happens to him? <laughs> he's waiting for the other shoe to drop and he's kind of sweating it but nothing happens the other thing here is these guys were very anti-Semitic they hated the Jews when, when, uh, when Pilate goes into uh, to Rome when he takes over in 26 AD uh, you know they have the, they have the big uh, from those kind of classic uh, Roman movies the guys are out front with the poles and it's always got kind of the, the little statue on it that's, uh, you know, supposed to be representative of Rome and so forth. Then over, it went over real big in Jerusalem where they kind of just had this thing about idolatry and statues. So a lot of the Romans would actually just carry the Roman flag. I mean, why create problems? Uh, not Pilate. He just does it anyway. He doesn't give a rip and uh, infuriates them. Uh, later, when he uh, needs money to build an aqueduct, he goes... He goes into the, the Jewish temple and he goes into the offering thing and rip, with, with a few guards around him, rips, rips the uh, top off of the, you know, where they would place the offering and takes all of the shekels, takes, takes the money and uses it to build an aqueduct. Uh, the Jews riot against him uh, and, and they slaughter every one of them. It, it was so bad that uh, Josephus tells us their blood was mingled with the blood of the lambs that were being sacrificed in the temple that day. The Jews hate Pontius Pilate. Uh, we, okay, so that's, that's one dynamic. You got the Sanhedrin that should hate him as much as well, that are now trying to, to uh, you know, cut a deal with him, uh, in a sense, to get Jesus killed. Uh, you've got a situation uh, in Rome where Pontius Pilate, if he makes one false mistake, 
again, because, because they both were so anti-Semitic, when Caesar comes back over, kills Serjanus and so forth, he now gives a little f more favor to, to the Jews as kind of a response from that. So now Pontius Pilate is down there ruling. If he doesn't handle this whole thing right with Jesus, there's another riot in the city or something goes on. It's not like he's going to lose his job. He's going to get killed. So there, there's a lot on the line. That's, that's a whole dynamic. So you understand that, that Caiaphas and Annas, they know this. They understand this. And they know that they can, they're going to say at one point in time when he's resisting a little bit because he's trying to get out of it all the way. They said, aren't you a friend of Caesar? Wow, that kind of rings a bell there, doesn't it? And uh, he, he's sweating bullets over this whole thing. You know, we actually could do a whole sermon, and I have, about Pontius Pilate being on trial before Jesus. Because Jesus is there. I mean, he's just doing his thing, and he's going to go through, and he's going to die for our sins. The guy squirming in, in all this is Pontius Pilate. So uh, that needs to be uh, uh, understood. And uh, uh, very interesting. Secondly, Pilate reviews the evidence based on the charges brought against him, uh, against Jesus. And, uh, and those are mentioned specifically in Luke's account. They said that he was perverting the nation, which means he was leading the people away from Jewish traditions. And Pilate goes, I don't care about that. Uh, and then they say he's opposing taxes. Of course, they had no evidence for that. In fact, Jesus said, render unto Caesar's what is Caesar's. But the, uh, the one that they kind of try to get to stick is and mentioned in Matthew's text here. Jesus claimed to be the king. And that's why Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Now keep in mind the picture. Jesus is before Pontius Pilate. He's, uh, his face has been beaten to a pulp already. Uh, he has uh, already been beaten uh, by, uh, with rods, 39 lashes, not 40, less one for mercy by, by the Jews. Uh, and, uh, and now he's before Pontius. He's not looking real royal at, at this point. And Pilate's saying, are you a king? And of course, Jesus replies in the affirmative. Now, the third thing in verses 15 to 23 is that Pilate attempts to release Jesus, as we've uh, mentioned. John 18, he takes Jesus away privately to talk to him with, without the chief priests there and so forth. And he says this in John 18, 36. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now... My kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born. And for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of the truth listens to me. What is truth? Pilate asked. With this he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. Uh, a couple of things here is uh, interesting, and if you went through the Truth Project uh, with us, you'll remember this is kind of how it all begins. Why was Jesus born? Why did he come? Certainly to die for the sins of the world, but what Jesus says here in terms of why he came is to testify to the truth, because truth is on trial, and it's on trial today. Uh, one, of, one of the reasons we've got huge economic problems in our country and political problems is people believe no longer you have to tell the truth or that there even is such a thing as absolute truth. It's still on trial. And a lot of people do not believe the words of Jesus, who he was, doesn't matter of the miracles, the history or anything else, because they do not believe in anything absolute. But Jesus said, truth is on trial and I am the truth. I am the way, the truth and the life and no man comes to the Father but through me. And here he is, the Son of God. Pontius Pilate asked Jesus, the Son of God, what is truth? He's not looking for an answer. It's a sarcastic statement. But he goes out at this point there in verse 4, and he says, I find no basis for a charge against this man. It's a legal finding. It's a technical term. According to Roman law, there was only one thing that Pilate could do at that point. <coughs> cut the bonds off of his hands and release him. That was the only thing that he could do legally. But we got a problem. <laughs> if he does that, those guys are going to cause a riot. They're going to report back to Rome what's going on, and Pilate's in trouble. So he's, he's trying to, to release Jesus uh, the best that he can. Later in John 19, 12, it actually says, from then on, 
Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jews kept shouting, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. So again, the reminder of the uh, precarious position that, uh, that he's in. Uh, again, Jesus is not the one trying to escape here. <laughs> Pilate is the one trying to escape uh, the situation. Can you imagine a judge asking the people to help them make a, a decision? Uh, add on top of that what we have in our text in verse 19. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal in a dream because of him. Oh, great. <laughs> That only confirms what I'm already concerned about. So again, Pilate thought to release Jesus in a way, in a way to give them a choice. And of course, Matthew tells us it was a custom by the Jews to try to, uh, 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 excuse me, by the Romans to try to appease the Jews at this time during a feast, during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, to release a, a criminal. So what he does is he takes Charles Manson out of prison, a notorious criminal, okay, uh, Barabbas. This is not a guy with a lot of parking tickets here. We're talking about a very bad guy. And he takes him out thinking that if I, if I, what's his crime? He thinks he's a king, you know. I can already even recognize him as being a person because he's beat up so bad. So I'm going to give him him. Do you want him or do you want Charles Manson? Which one of these guys do you want on the streets? So he's trying to, again, to kind of the best he can uh, you know, manipulate the situation so he can get, get out of it and, and do nothing to this innocent man. Uh, and what he's really trying to do is create a scapegoat. Now that's interesting because there is one and it's right at this time. It's during Passover. Remember, part of everything else that goes on, two goats are taken into the temple uh, that are selected. They're going to be sacrificed. One is sacrificed for the sins of the people there in the temple. The other one has a scarlet uh, uh, yarn tied on one of his horns, and then he is the scapegoat. He is led out the east gate, uh, down the Kidron Valley, up the Mount of Olives, down the other side, out past Bethany, and out into the wilderness, as far as the high priest could probably walk to take him. Uh, because one of them represented the fact that this goat died, his blood was shed for the sins of the people. This goat is taken away to remember that, and God remembers our sins no more. They are taken away and remembered no more. So it was kind of a sticky situation if that goat ever wandered back into the city. <laughs> it's like, not good. <laughs> so make sure he stays, uh, stays out there. Skits where we get the term scapegoat, and that's what's going on here. Uh, Pontius Pilate is looking for a, for a scapegoat. We're reminded of the words of Jeremiah that Jesus has just mentioned the night before Jeremiah 31, the new covenant, verse 34. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Uh, the crowd here is sometimes depicted as the same crowd that cried, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's not the same crowd. Uh, that crowd was... Um, the sojourners, the pilgrims that, that uh, had seen Jesus do all of the miracles, healed thousands of people, fed thousands of people, uh, and, uh, and they have followed him. They're all making their way to Jerusalem. There's an entourage that comes. Now you have the healing of uh, a Lazarus, raising him from the dead. You have all of those people. The people from Jerusalem become aware of it. And of course, then when Jesus marches into the city on that Sunday, we call Palm Sunday because of their palm branches uh, that they put before him. He rides on the donkey in, in uh, fulfillment of Zechariah 9, 9. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You are the Messiah. This crowd says, crucify, it's a different crowd. Uh, this is a different crowd that is totally under the control and the influence and the bribery of, again, this very corrupt leadership that is ruling over, over Jerusalem. We might call them the Jerusalemites or something, you know, to kind of make a distinction. It's not the same crowd. I mean, it's possible there's a few people that are there in, in both places at the same time, but basically it's not the same crowd. This crowd is, is screaming, crucify him. Pilate uh, forth sought to end his responsibility. He does that by washing his hands in, in public. And, uh, and again, just, uh, he's just trying to get out of it. And he's saying, basically, I'm washing my hands. This is all, all you're doing. And they're saying, fine, let his blood be on our head and on our children, which is, uh, again, a very 
radical statement to make. Mark 15, 15 uh, says, uh, a little repetitive, but I kind of want to make a point here. It says, wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. I just, you know, was thinking about that, reading through that this week, and you can go back and look in all the Gospels, and that's what you get. He had Jesus flogged, four words. Now, when you think of, again, the Mel Gibson film, The Passion, that's what the whole thing focuses on, is the beating that Jesus took at the hands of the Romans. And yet, in, in the Bible, we've got four words, and, and that's all that's said. Now, we know what happened because of history. We don't know what happened because of what it says in Scripture. I just, I just thought that was interesting, that, that as the Holy Spirit is inspiring them to write, and, and, and they knew, they would know. I mean, it's... You know, it's, it's, it's something that, that was part of their culture that was there and living under the Romans, and this was a horrific thing. And when somebody was flogged, they knew it, they had the mental picture. They knew exactly uh, what, what went on. And it's like, but we're not writing it down. <laughs> we're not writing it down. It's just, we just know. And they just kind of move on. I just, uh, I just thought, uh, thought the silence of the whole thing was, uh, was interesting. But again, of history, we know that Jesus would have been tied around a pole which stretches out those back muscles and makes them tense and tight so they would rip open more easily. And the cat of nine tails accurately portrayed in the Passion of the Christ, uh, as we've mentioned, uh, bits of glass, pottery shards and so forth at the end of several braided strips. Uh, and, and as it comes down on the back, uh, it's, it's not meant to put a few bruises and stripes there. It's meant to tear the flesh away, which it did. Then muscle tissue and eventually sometimes uh, exposing internal organs. Most people bled to death. That, that was it. The ones that didn't, many went insane just because of, of the torture uh, uh, of itself. Uh, but Jesus endures uh, the whole thing. And um, he came to testify to truth and there was quite a price uh, for, for truth. And certainly part of, as we looked at a few weeks ago, his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, if there'd be another way, then take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And, and we talked about the fact that Jesus endures all of this to show us what a submitted life looks like. Was it necessary for him to suffer in order to pay the price for our sins? And I want to say no. He needed to die on the cross and his blood be shed. But this is a whole nother thing that he's willing to go through uh, on our behalf. Uh, again, Pilate sought to end his responsibility by satisfying the crowd and, and they cry out. Now, uh, in the words of the Jews by Josephus, he tells us about, and you can read about it, I, I have, uh, the uh, tremendous siege against the uh, city of Jerusalem, the horrible carnage, the things that happened there in 70 A.D., and uh, oh, the over a million that, that are uh, slaughtered in, in the streets there. And again, that's when the temple is burned down and it's, it's toppled. Not one stone was left on another, as Jesus said would be the case. Uh, and thirdly, Pilate sought to end his responsibility with the flogging of Jesus. I just wanted to read uh, a couple of verses from Isaiah 53 uh, that uh, Isaiah is prophesying what would happen to the Messiah. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And it was the Lord that laid on him the iniquity of us, of us all. The fifth thing here is the Roman soldiers are the ones who continue the torture of Jesus. And as I mentioned, as they take him into the praetorium and, and, um, and how uh, you can actually go to that, that place, they take one of their, one of their robes that was the, the color of Rome that they placed on him and, and mock him and spit on him and continue the, the beating of him. And we mentioned that to point out the fact, again, because in 2,000 years of Christianity, much of what the, uh, the church, quote, the church has said is that Jesus died at the hands of the Jews, and, and uh, obviously that's not true. Uh, he was handed over, and as Jesus predicted, before he ever went down there, he would be handed over to the Gentiles, and that's who would actually would 
torture him and, uh, and end his life. And, um, uh, and uh, it's become one of the, uh, you know, concerns or just kind of a, a mystery, you know, that, uh, that you could go for, for 2,000 years with a church that basically is supposed to be primarily Jewish that has very few Jewish people in it. And there's a reason for it. And it's because of some of the misleading teaching that we found in, uh, in Scripture. And as David Hawking is with us, and one of the reasons we do the prophecy conference is to highlight or go through the Scriptures and the prophecies, prophecies to understand once again that uh, the nation of Israel back into the land is a fulfillment of, uh, of prophecy. And, um, and that uh, the anti-Semitism that we see have seen in the church for 2,000 years, which obviously is a travesty that we see growing tremendously around the world. And there's some websites you can read some of the things that are going on around the world today against Jews is, is horrific. It's getting very bad uh, in Europe in particular. And of course, you have a, an ongoing Muslim pop population in, in the major cities of Europe today. And it's growing. It's not growing by conversion. It's growing by immigration. Uh, and by birth, and uh, getting very, very dangerous for Jews to live even in Western Europe these days. So again, it's the Roman soldiers uh, that continue the torture of Jesus, so not the Jews themselves. Therefore, let's get the Italians. You know, they're the ones that, not, you know, again, Jesus laid down his life. It's the Father that sends him there. But uh, Psalm 69, there are some prophecies fulfilled here. I just want to read a few of them. Psalm 69 Verse 7 and 9 says of, of the Messiah, For I endure scorn for your sake, and shame covers my face. I am a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my own mother's sons. For zeal for your house consumes me, and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. Later in verse 19, You know how I am scorned, disgraced, and shamed. All my enemies are before you. Scorn has broken my heart and has left me helpless. I look for sympathy, but there is none. For comforters, but I have found none. And so Jesus, just those four words, but he's just flogged. And then we are introduced, lastly, to Simon of Cyrene, six. He's, he's required to carry the cross of, uh, of Jesus. And uh, remember, he's been up all night, arrested uh, in the evening, following the Seder there on the Mount of Olives, uh, six trials, uh, beaten uh, on several occasions and now scourged and now expected to carry the Roman cross and the Roman soldiers probably not wanting to prolong their duty and uh, they, uh, they grab a guy off the streets. No, Simon is there just to celebrate, uh, probably with his family, celebrate uh, Passover and the Feast of Un Unleavened Bread. And, uh, you know, he wasn't on the side going, hey, pick me, pick me. You know, it was, it was get over here and... Uh, Oh, yeah, hey, I'm vacation, got plenty of time. Carry the wooden cross over to there. Yeah, be happy to, kind of looking for something to do here today. That's, that's not what's going on here at all. Uh, he probably was horrified. Who carries the cross? The criminal, the person deserving death. Was he a little concerned about who he is and why he's being associated with? I'm, I'm sure he's not thrilled with this uh, by any stretch of the imagination. But what's very interesting is that uh, Matthew mentions him by name because he expects we know who he is. <laughs> he doesn't say, got some guy in the crowd. Got, he got Simon. In, in fact, in, uh, in Mark's gospel, uh, he says, you know, the father of Alexander and Rufus. So um, Mark figures we know this guy. Those people reading Mark's gospel for the first time. You know, Alexander and Rufus, his dad, that's the guy that carried the cross. So evidently, at least the sons become believers, and, and uh, the implication certainly is that uh, Simon as well. And you can imagine the experience of carrying that cross <coughs> next to Jesus and getting there, and you're there, and you, you see the, the whole thing, the things we're about to study here in the, uh, in the next couple of weeks, and, and uh, life-changing to, to say the least. I wanted to uh, uh, close with this uh, little uh, kind of a quote and, a, and an illustration, but again, the, the contrast that, that uh, Matthew, and we, we've mentioned several times that, that Matthew is, uh, really arranges his information topically for us and the way he puts it together. And uh, it, really, it really 
helps it work, you know, when you're teaching through it on a, on a Sunday morning. That uh, it's got these uh, great contrasts. Uh, Judas, you know, who has no repentance uh, and, uh, and ends up tragically uh, ending his life. Pilate, who's just, uh, man, he's squirming. He's the guy on trial. It's like he's between a rock and a hard place. He's, he's innocent. He's trying to let him go. Then his wife says, I've had a dream. Don't have anything to do with that guy. You know, he's an innocent man. I declare him innocent. We need to set him free. And they go, no, we'll take Charles Manson instead. We want that guy crucified. What is going on here? I mean, that, that had to be so weird. Can you imagine Pilate? And they, they pick Charles Manson. Can you stay with me just for a sake of illustration? They picked that guy to set free on the streets instead of Jesus. Uh, it, it, the whole, he had to be mystified by, by the whole thing. Uh, what happens to him? I'm going by memory a little bit, but I do know it's not much longer that, that he loses his position. Uh, him and his wife and, and this whole thing, the whole political uh, thing catches up with them. And, and, uh, and, and basically, they're, they're, they're sent off... Um, someplace lovely like Gaul. I mean, it could be okay, but it sounds bad. Gaul, you know, but, uh, but they're, they're, they're sent off and they, uh, all their money's taken away. It just, it just, you know, things don't end well for Pontius Pilate. And uh, it reminds you of Jesus saying, if any man would come after me, he must deny himself and pick up his cross and, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life, like Pilate, will lose it. But if you're willing, whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his own soul? That's Pilate. That's Judas. You know, for different, different reasons. And then you end with Simon the Cyrene, this guy that happenstance, coincidence, just happened to be there. Random. I don't think so. God orchestrates the events so this guy ends up being the, the carrier of the cross of, uh, of Jesus. But there was a price to be paid for it all. Uh, this article I, I read a, a number of years ago, and the uh, guy is talking about going to, uh, named Colin Smith, he's a pastor, and he uh, was talking about his dad would go to auctions and, and purchase things, and he took him, you know, when he was a pretty young kid, and, but he had to kind of prep him. It's like, no, when we're there, just keep your hands on your on your lap, you know, don't, don't scratch your nose or itch your ear. I don't care how bad it's itching. When that guy's up there doing his thing and he's bidding, don't make any motions, you know, because it could be misconstrued that you want to you wanna bid. Uh, and then he says this in the article. Then he said to me, always remember this. Whenever you go to an auction sale, make sure you know your upper limit price. You know, you don't get caught up and, you know, spend, spend more than you should for something. And he went on and said, this was ingrained in me. The great danger for us is that we walk into the Christian life knowing clearly our upper limit price. Jesus does not allow us to set that. He said, if you save your life, you will lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake and the gospel, you'll find it. Our calling is to a life of unconditional obedience where the price is unknown. And sometimes we don't really realize that. I'll serve you, Lord, as long as... But don't ask me to, if I ever had to, <laughs> and we, we kind of want to put a, a ceiling on it, the upper level. It works in an auction. It doesn't really work in, in, in following, following the Lord. And, uh, and I'm hoping that as we go through this, this time uh, of studying this period of what Jesus did, what God did on our behalf, we might be able to release some of those upper limits and just say, Lord, I'll just follow you, whatever you have for me. Because... I realize what you did for me. You, you set no limit and no price on what you would do to purchase now my what salvation. I praise you, Lord, of all creation. You ordained the sun to rise and fall. You scatter the stars across the heavens. You come close enough to hear me call Now I want to say Holy is your name Let all creation proclaim Holy is 
Stand together. Now is the time to 
in your name there is strength to remain to stand in spite of pain in your home